Hi guys, I hope everybody's well today. This is Talking Heads of Atascacita and I am very, very happy to be here with Monsignor James Golosinski. Happy Father's Day. Thank you. Today we're going to talk about the Eucharist some more because that is, uh, that's a vital part of our existence, isn't it? The summit and the source of the yes, true Christian spirit. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm. Well, last week we looked at the real presence of our Lord. We'd already twice in the past dealt with the Eucharist. The first time was as a sacrament of charity. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the title of an apostolic constitution that uh, Pope Benedict XVI wrote, mm -hmm. in which he summarized the uh, special synod on the Eucharist mm -hmm. of how many, how, I don't know how many years ago it was, and mm -hmm. then we also spent time on the Eucharist as sacrifice, the Passover, huh? yeah. the Passover. Mm -hmm. And so uh, last week, in preparation for the Feast of Corpus Christi, we looked at the Eucharist from the standpoint of the real presence, mm -hmm. because there is so, so, so much confusion at mm -hmm. the present time. People talking about it. The Eucharist being a symbol, right. a symbol of our Lord. Mm -hmm. And so what we did was, first we looked at chapter 6 in John, where our Lord gave the promise of the Eucharist, and then uh, looked at the, those places in the Acts of the Apostles where the breaking of the bread is mentioned. Mm -hmm. For example, when on the first day of the week we, had, we met for the breaking of the bread. And uh, so that raised the question, what is this breaking of the bread? Mm -hmm. And we find a definition in uh, St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians in both chapters 10 and 11. Am I right? Yes, 10 and 11. He uh, takes up the Eucharist and he said, the, the breaking of the bread is not a participation in the body of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Well, some people quote from the sixth chapter of John's Gospel to oppose the uh, understanding of the real presence of our Lord. Mm -hmm. And it's one verse, one verse in uh, this whole treatment of our Lord's meeting with people in the synagogue in Capernaum the day after he had multiplied the loaves and the fishes. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told them uh, not to seek the bread that perishes, but for that which endures to eternal life, which the Father, which the Son will give him. And, and I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. And then uh, finally, uh, the, the hammer. Mm -hmm. the, I am the bread that has come down from heaven, and the bread that I shall give is my flesh mm -hmm. for the life of the world. Mm -hmm. And... No, the crowd's uh, reaction was, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They were scandalized, weren't they? Yeah, they took him, literally. Mm -hmm. They didn't say to one another, what's he talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, our Lord, in a lot of other places, use symbolic language. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of I am's. Mm -hmm. I am the good shepherd. Mm -hmm. Didn't our Lord have a flock of sheep? Not, not real sheep, huh? Mm -hmm. right. uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we find our Lord frequently saying, I am. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's symbolic language. Mm -hmm. In this case, he says, I am the living bread. Is mm -hmm. it symbolic language in this case too? Mm -hmm. Well, the listeners did not take it uh, as symbolic. Right. I mean, they took him to be speaking literally mm -hmm. because they said, how? Mm -hmm. They didn't say, what is he talking about? Right. That's right. They said, how mm -hmm. can this man give us his flesh to eat? And then our Lord kept reinforcing it. Uh, then he's talking about drinking his blood, mm -hmm. which was abhorrent to the Jews. Mm -hmm. That was a violation was of kosher. Yeah. And uh, then uh, we read in verse 60, many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Mm -hmm. And at the conclusion of the chapter, we read that uh, from this time onward, many, yeah, uh, Truth, you know, 66. Yeah. After this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went about with him. Mm -hmm. 
And he let them go. So he didn't say, wait, come back. You misunderstood. Uh-huh, right, uh-huh. right. Yeah. No, he let them go. Mm-hmm. And frequently, when he and the apostles were alone, uh, the apostles would ask him for explanations. Mm-hmm. Explain to us the parable of the wheat and the mm-hmm. weeds, for mm-hmm. example. In this case, before they had a chance to ask him, he then says to them, do you also want to go away? Mm-hmm. I mean, he challenges them That's right. to take it literally. After he had just said something yeah. so do you shocking. Also, do you also? These others had taken it literally, and then so he says to you, uh, uh, do you also want to go away? Mm-hmm. And, of course, Peter gave the correct That's answer. That's the answer. That's right. Yeah, we won't go into that. Mm-hmm. But uh, in uh, the reaction to the statement, this is a hard saying, who, who can listen to it, mm-hmm. uh, we read, Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples murmured at it, said to them, do you take offense at this? And what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Now, some people fasten on this. They say, look, our Lord said, uh, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Mm -hmm. And they they read into that the idea all of this is not to be taken literally Mm -hmm. because this is spirit and life. But look at the context. Yeah, you have to add, you have to isolate it and completely take it out of context. Isolate it from what? From the context and the rest of what he said. Yeah, but but the context is this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Yeah, he doesn't say, let me make it easy for you, huh? Yeah, see, see, that, <laughs> that's right. These You're words, right. these <laughs> words are in, are in response to the disciples. Yeah. This is a hard saying. Who that's can right. listen to it? Who can take it literally? Mm-hmm. And then our Lord says, "These words, mm-hmm. huh? These words. Yeah. The, that's what he's. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Uh, the words, the words I just said mm-hmm. about eating my flesh and drinking my blood. The, these words are spirit and life. They're not." A hard saying to be rejected That's because right. you uh, cannot accept them literally. Mm-hmm. So that's the response to this. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that is the only, only objection I have ever found uh, on the part of those who refused to accept the, uh, the real presence, real of, presence our of our Lord yeah. as we and the Orthodox understand mm-hmm. it. Now, you know, there are other people also who... Uh, have communion Mm -hmm. in their churches. Some years ago, I gave instructions to a man who was very, very zealous in an Episcopal church, one Mm -hmm. of the really conservative ones here in town. And we got to talking about the understanding of the the presence of our Lord. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he he told me he went back and he spoke with the pastor of the church. And he said, what is to be done with hosts that are left over after words. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And there were three things. Mm. I don't remember the first two. Mm-hmm. I remember the, th- the third was. The third was, well, you could put it out on the lawn for the birds to eat. Oh, my goodness. Don't throw it in the trash can. Okay. It's just a symbol. Which does happen in certain right. places. It does. Yeah, it does. Because I, I know uh, the conversion story of a young fellow who uh, was attending uh, attending uh, that same church, mm-hmm. but at the time of an earlier pastor. Okay. And uh, they were, he told about how once, and he was very, very zealous. He was uh, attending Texas Medical School. And in the morning on his way to the medical school, he would always stop off at the church. Mm-hmm. And one time he and several others were with the pastor and they were you know, commiserating about the horrible state of the world. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, at least we have, you know, we, we have the consolation of having our Lord in the Eucharist. Oh, that's neat. Huh. But then he was overruled. He said, well, that's not what we believe. Oh, okay. Hmm. Well, on the Internet a few days ago, I heard about... And then about, he met you. No, no, I never met him. Oh, okay. I, okay. I, I heard, heard about him only. 
By the time I met him, no. uh, he had already graduated from med school, and I think he was up in uh, New York. Okay. But uh, a few days ago, on the internet, I read about a scandal. It happened in London, and uh, the, the person, uh, the clergy, the woman, and she was outside of the, the church, mm -hmm. and she was in, greeting people and inviting them to come in, mm -hmm. and there was this man, and he had a, his dog with him. Mm -hmm. And so she invited him to come in, she said, I'll give you Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. And so the man went in with his dog. I know what's going to happen. You're so psychic. Uh, it's my my womanly ways, my powers, or common sense. <laughs> Not only did the man. Yeah, I know. The dog he wants his communion too. Is that what happened? Oh, he called yeah. her big flap. Mm -hmm. Big, big because flap. They, because she refused the dog? No, she gave she to did? the dog. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Which is worse? <laughs> Yeah, and uh, there was an explanation, the reason why a lot of people oh, were offended, because you know, this represents, you know, represents I have Lord, it's a redemption Something for us. Something sacred. It represents, you see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, let's move on. Recently, in... So many layers to that. When senior, there are so many layers there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well... Be before we move on, before we move on, the good news, uh, this is on the internet a few days ago. This is out of Germany. Now, this has to do with our epidemic. And in this uh, church, Würzburg, in the Diocese of Würzburg, uh, the story goes that uh, uh, the pastor mm -hmm. of... Uh, yeah, the St. Albert's is the oh, name wow. of the parish. Mm -hmm. Tells and the laity. On, on the website, it told the people on Pentecost Sunday and on Pentecost Monday. I didn't know. It says that uh, Pentecost Monday is a holy day of obligation in Germany. Oh, I didn't know that. It's a surprise to me, yeah. And on Pentecost Sunday, Pentecost Monday, and Trinity Sunday. The faithful at home make the sign of the cross over bread and wine, say a short prayer, and consume bread and wine. For the bread they are to say, quote, we take and eat the bread. It is for us the body of Christ, which was given up for us. We do this in his memory, unquote. Similarly, for the wine, the parishioners say, quote, we take and drink the wine. It is for us the blood of Jesus, the new covenant in his blood, which was shed for us for the forgiveness of sins, unquote. Then on Trinity Sunday, uh, the, for us, is uh, is dropped, and the, uh, there's something about quote eat the blessed bread and drink the wine in remembrance of Jesus and the certainty of His whole union in love to us. Is that a Catholic church? Unquote. It's a yes. Catholic church. Saint Albert's in the Diocese of Würzburg in Germany. Now, you know, in these days of confusion, priests should not do something like that. Why do we need why do we need priests if we can do that? May I be frankly honest? Well, in these days when so many Catholics uh, have the understanding that it's just a symbol, mm -hmm. well, it seems to me action of this sort yeah, would just feed. It reinforces that idea. That's exactly yeah, right. That's, mm -hmm. That was the reaction I had when I read it on the uh, internet that this would just you know reinforce this misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Well, there's good news out of Poland, though. This is from a recent issue of the uh, National Catholic, Catholic Register, Register. The, uh, the first uh, week of May. Mm -hmm. And the heading is, Bishop Approves Eucharistic Miracle in Poland. Eucharistic Miracle. Uh, you know, uh, there was a... A woman uh, in New Orleans. Her name was Joan Carol Cruz. Joan Carol Cruz. And uh, I met her daughter. Oh. Uh, her daughter was over from New Orleans mm -hmm. and came to a daily mass several times. Because you know everybody. <laughs> two degrees of separation. <laughs> I think it's one and a half. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, it, it was really pleasant meeting her. Mm -hmm. She introduced herself to me as the daughter of Joan Carroll Cruz, and mm -hmm. she told me the family history and everything, and her mother wrote a book, 
Eucharistic miracles. Eucharistic miracles. And it's a favorite is... of many, many people. Mm -hmm. Many, many people. Mm -hmm. There's another one called the Incorruptibles. That's another okay. big favorite mm -hmm. uh, of hers mm -hmm. uh, that she has written. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, uh, she told me this sad story that uh, Katrina, her mother's entire library, was, was oh. wiped out. Well, you know, oh, Mother it, Nature. Well, she told mm -hmm. me her mother had written 16, had published 16 books. 16 books. So you know she must have had a big library. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was so sad uh, that, that to sad. hear that her mother had suffered that loss. Mm -hmm. But anyway, this is news out of Poland, and uh, uh, the subheading is Red Stained Host Medically Tests as Human Muscle. Mm. And the story is rather short. Mm -hmm. A bleeding host that, quote, has the hallmarks of a Eucharistic miracle, unquote, was approved for veneration in Poland last month. The announcement was made by Bishop Zygmunt Kurnikowski of Legnica on April the 17th. Mm -hmm. On Christmas Day, 2013, a consecrated host fell to the floor, the bishop said. It was picked up and placed in a container with water. Soon after that, red stains appeared on the host. Mm -hmm. See, this is one of the things that can be done with a host like that. If it has become dirtied, mm -hmm. placed in water, and then it dissolves. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when this was done, red stains appeared mm -hmm. on the host. Then uh, an earlier bishop of the, of the diocese, uh, Stefan uh, Chichi, created a commission. Created, he didn't create, he formed a commission, appointed a commission. <laughs> Your language is very precise. He didn't create something out of nothing, so he didn't create it, huh? Good. He formed it. Good. I was paying attention that time. Good. Uh, to monitor the unfolding event. In February 2014, 2014, a small fragment was placed on a corporal and underwent testing by various research institutes. Mm. The final medical statement by the Department of Forensic Medicine found, quote, in the histopathological image, the fragments were found containing the fragmented parts of the cross striated muscle. Mm -hmm. It is most similar to the heart muscle. Unquote. Tests also determined the tissue is to be is the tissue to be of human origin and found that it bore signs of distress. Mm -hmm. oh. Tomorrow the feast of what? Sacred Heart. Mm. Seeing, saying that the host, quote, has the hallmarks of a Eucharistic miracle, unquote, Bishop Kronikowski explained that in January 2016, he presented the matter to the Vatican Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. What they do is they review the work that the local bishop has done. And in April, uh, you know, a couple months ago, in accordance with the Holy See's recommendations, he asked parish priest Andrew Zambrese to, quote, prepare a suitable place for the relics so that uh, the faithful could venerate it. Mm -hmm. And here is a wow. photograph. Mm -hmm. It's uh, like a monstrance. Mm -hmm. uh, it's and not holding a host. Mm -hmm. Well, it's holding the host, mm -hmm. but it's not the white host mm -hmm. that we use for benediction. Blood it's holding. Red. Yes. Yeah. Holding a. Uh, Oh, sacred heart of Jesus. Have mercy on us. Does that sound, sound like a, a symbol? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -mm -mm. Does that sound like a symbolic presence? No, it doesn't. It sounds literal. Mm -hmm. Medically um, yeah, so determined. If any, of you, if any of you have never heard about these Eucharistic miracles, I would encourage you mm -hmm. to get a copy of Joan Carroll Cruz's uh, book, Eucharistic yeah. Miracles. Mm -hmm. Like I said earlier, it's, it's a favorite book of, of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> we will continue on <clears throat> with the good. Now, this is another recent issue of, uh, of the uh, National Catholic Register mm -hmm. for the first week in June. Have y'all ever been to Rome? No. No, not the bread well. Well, there are many old churches in Rome. Mm -hmm. uh, Make Annunciation look like a little baby church, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, because they are so old, 
they require a lot of maintenance, mm -hmm. a lot of repair, a mm -hmm. lot of upkeep. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> whenever I'm in Rome, well, at night I like to make them prepare a route. In the morning I eat breakfast, mm -hmm. and then I hit the road, and I'll go in a certain direction. And there's a church here, and there's a church here, and a church here. Mm -hmm. And down the side street, there's mm -hmm. a church there, mm -hmm. and there's a church. Mm -hmm. And this one morning, I headed up to St. Mary Major, mm -hmm. one of the four uh, major basilicas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I turned to the right, mm -hmm. and it was church hopping. Mm -hmm. And, oh, I forgot to mention, there was this small church on the other side of the street. So I crossed over and went in, and guess what was there? The image of Our Lady of Perpetual Health. Oh. The original. Oh. Oh, wow. It's a redemptorist parish. Wow. And Pius IX uh, gave the image you know, to them, and they have it there. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the wonderful things about Rome. You go into a church, Treasures and you discover things, things that you know. Right. It's really, really wonderful. Yeah, that's a powerful image in my own life. Although sometimes you have to kind of wonder about the stories. Mm -hmm. Like there was this one very close to the place where I was staying, the mm -hmm. graduate school uh, of the North American College, they purport to have the skull of John the Baptist. <laughs> Somehow they got it away from Herodia. <laughs> hey, well, you never know. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, and, and anyway, my route was I was going to go and visit uh, uh, Santa Croce, mm -hmm. the Church of the Holy Cross, mm -hmm. and then continue on to St. John Lateran, mm -hmm. which is the cathedral church of, uh, of, uh, of the Diocese of Rome. Mm -hmm. That's really, ins really inspirational because there's a monument of the Franciscans, mm -hmm. because that's where St. Francis went, okay. and he met Pope Innocent III, uh, I can't remember for sure, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Pope Innocent, uh, I think it was, had this dream that his cathedral across the street, in those days the popes didn't live at St. Peter's, they lived at their cathedral, mm -hmm. St. John Lateran, mm -hmm. and he had a dream that the church was tottering, and this scruffy little man came along and shored it up. And the next morning, St. Francis arrives. St. <laughs> oh, Francis arrives, mm -hmm. asking for approval for his rule for mm -hmm. this and, uh, That's the fastest imprimatur anybody ever had. <laughs> Boom. And, but anyway, there's a monument to the Franciscans. They're facing the. Uh, just wonderful. Yeah. Just wonderful in Rome. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, mm -hmm. I went. I didn't get to go in the Church of the Holy Cross because it was under repair. Mm -hmm. But this story comes from from it mm -hmm. in Italian. It's called Santa Croce, and uh, it's written by this fellow John uh, Grandelsky. And he said, most of the visitors in Rome head for St. Peter's Basilica. Mm -hmm. uh, those with a little more time usually visit the four papal basilicas, St. Peter's, St. John Lateran, St. Mary Major, mm -hmm. and St. Paul outside the walls. Mm -hmm. Rome has, however, more than 50 other minor basilicas. One of them, the Basilica of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem, Santa Croce in uh, Jerusalem, is also one of the seven pilgrim churches of Rome. Mm -hmm. Church is visited by pilgrims mm -hmm. during the holy year to gain its indulgence. It's just a few blocks from St. John Lateran. Mm -hmm. They're long blocks, though, I tell you. Mm -hmm. The Basilica of the Holy Cross is noted as uh, the site where the instruments of Christ's passion, including fragments of the true cross collected by St. Um, uh, Helena, the mother of Constantine, are kept. Mm -hmm. But I want to focus on a more modern relic found there, the tomb of Antonietta Mayo, M-E-O. Antonio, Antonio Mayo, she lived from 1930 to 1937. Oh. And uh, she's known affectionately as Nemolina. 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 She was born, baptized at, and grew up near the basilica. An active and friendly little girl, she lost her leg at age five to, oh, to, no. bone, to bone cancer. Oh, baby. A oh, disease, baby. A disease that within two years took her life. <sighs> what makes Nimolina stand out were her letters. That's quotations. 
Emmelina very much wanted to receive her first Holy Communion, and so began her correspondence with, quote, Caro Bambino Gesù. Bye. And, uh, Bye. meaning, uh, dear baby Jesus. Oh, oh my mm-hmm. goodness. They are the letters of a little child written with the sincerity of a little child. Mm-hmm. A child uh, to a child. Mm-hmm. With the concerns of a child. Mm-hmm. And the longing of that child to receive the child. They're not very long, usually three or four sentences, telling about what's going on in her life and how her and her longing for Jesus. They brim with the directness of a child and often include regards to his mother, uh, Madonina, mm-hmm. and usually li- little Madonna mm-hmm. uh, in Italian. And, and usually, usually close. Baci a salute dalla tua Antonioneta. Kisses and greetings from your Antonioneta. <laughs> there are more than 160 of them, along with her own little diary and collection of thoughts. Mm-hmm. Her faith is simple and direct, mm-hmm. as when she writes about her deceased grandparents. Quote, I entrust to you also the souls of the poor dead, especially my grandpa Anthony, if he hasn't already gone to paradise, and also the other grandpa, John. Mm-hmm. Unquote. Mm-hmm. No, no going straight to heaven for this no. child. He's wise. Why Men, quote, world? forgive me, dear Jesus, who has been a little bad, and also my sister, and I promise that tomorrow I will be much better, unquote. That's number 38. Oh. Sometimes she also wrote to God the Father, quote, I love you very, very much. I mean, lots. <laughs> I, know, I know that I wrote that to you in the beginning, but I want to say it to you another time. Mm-hmm. That's 111. Oh. She made her first communion at Christmas, 1936, on December 13th. And that, that date she wrote, quote, Thank you that only 10 days are left. I will be very happy. Oh, wait a minute, before that, uh, 10 days before that. Uh, quote, Thank you that only 10 days are left. I will be very happy when I receive you. That's number 94. On December 15th, she wonders, quote, How beautiful that day will be, unquote. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and uh, makes her, and then when she makes her first communion, she, she mentions in passing that today is her birthday. And thank, quote, thank you that today I turn six. On the 16th, she tells Jesus that she will prepare a beautiful, soft little crib, dear Jesus, so you can rest well mm-hmm. in my heart. Oh, baby. Yeah. Oh. Matter of factly, she writes on December 17th. Quote, tell God the Father I'm happy that he inspired me to make my first communion on Christmas Day because it is the very day you were born on the earth to save us and die on the cross, unquote. That's number 98. Mm -hmm. Indeed, her first communion is in some sense so much expected and anticipated that on that day, her letter simply tells Jesus, Merry Christmas, I love Mom and Dad so much, Antonio and Adam. Mm-hmm. The next day she adds that she asked for those graces that I didn't ask for when I made communion. Mm-hmm. I mean, she understood the Eucharist. She was very, very and Those wise. words of our Lord, as I live by the Father, so he who feeds on me shall live by me. Amen. And she also promised, quote, I want to be always good, unquote. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have to turn the page. Uh, and it continues. Uh, Well, her last letter is touching, a kind of child's last will. Mm. Quote, thank you for sending me this illness because it is a means to arrive in paradise. She asked for, quote, the strength necessary to endure the pains that I offer for sinners, unquote. She then to Jesus writes, quote, I entrust to you my parents and Margarita, that's her sister. Mm. I send you so many greetings and kisses, unquote. And two months later, when she was dead, mm. her case was referred to the Congregation for the Cause of the Saints in 1972, and Pope Benedict XVI declared her venerable, mm. the first step toward possible beatification. And that happened on December 17, 2007. And then the author says, I first encountered the story of an Emolina by chance on a Sunday afternoon in Rome in 2013. I'd never before visited the Basilica of the Holy Cross 
And while I knew of its association with Christ's passion and Helena's quest for the true cross, it was only by accident I wandered into her tomb. That's where she's buried. Oh, they buried her there. Buried there. And most of what has been written about Nemolina, including her letters, appears to be in Italian. And anyway, there's a translation underway right now. And it would be a good thing to see the child's words published and broadly available in English. Mm -hmm. I can't think of a better little book to put in the hands of children preparing okay. for first confession okay. and okay. communion. <sighs> then nice. concludes, Amen. ex ore infantium, from the mouths of babes. Amen. <laughs> Amen. God finds perfect praise, as mm -hmm. Jesus reminds us in Matthew twenty one sixteen. Mm -hmm. It would be a good time, on this Corpus Christi, it would be a good time to get to know the little girl who wanted so much to receive her first communion, Antonio Mayo and Nenolina. Nenolina, pray for us. So oh, if any of you goodness. out there have children who are, uh, you're, you're preparing at home for first communion, I would encourage you to you know, investigate this. Okay. There's also... Nenolina. Blessed Imelda. Mm-hmm. Lambertini, yes. You know, I don't know a whole lot about her. How to, do you know a lot about her? Uh, just I have her little, holy card. Okay, oh. I have the little, it's a little book. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. When did she live? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read it. I don't remember. How old was she? How old was she? <laughs> Seven? I don't remember. Oh, about the same year. age. Uh -huh. About the same. Not five. I would have remembered that. I remember uh, when I was pastor in Nunciation, some people were at the time of children's first communion, they'd give, her, they'd give holy cards mm -hmm. with the image of uh, Blessed Imelda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that does it for today. Uh, before we sign off, I want to extend greetings to Sean and Bobby Leonard. I didn't know you were back in Houston <laughs> until just a short time ago. Very Glad nice. to have you back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Remember, I mean, I'm, I'm the one who married you <laughs> a I long, long time ago. I joined those two wonderful families, the, the Leonard family and the LeCompte family. Yeah. Nice. Nice, nice, mm -hmm. nice. Monsignor, should we close with a blessing? Fear not, little Amen. flock. It has pleased your Father to give you the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Monsignor. Sacred and Immaculate Hearts, pray for us or have mercy on us and pray for us. Bye, guys. <laughs>